uric acid level, when someone has a likelihood or has a risk factor for kidney stones, we want it to be below six. That's that's a number that we usually test on. Calcium oxalate stones are the most common type. And again, don't get caught up in the name calcium. Sorry, I found something. Don't get caught up in the name calcium and say, hey, the patient can't drink any milk or dairy products. It's not always the case, so be careful. Um, again, the doctor will decide what type of stone is this patient seem, seemingly to develop all the time. And this is a patient that maybe had one, two, three, four stones. Or is their uric acid level high? If the uric acid level is high in real life and in the story of the problem, what you're going to have that patient avoid is purine foods, foods that have purine. And so this, this is listed here, organ meats, poultry, fish, gravies, sardines, red wine. We just talked about that with that previous chart that we were looking at. If the patient's stone in the story is calcium oxalate stone, Here's the things that you kind of should avoid, uh, not kind of, you should tell the patient to try to avoid these things in their diet all the time. Spinach, black tea, cocoa, chocolate, beets, peanuts, okra, right? There's a listing here. They do have to limit their dairy products, but we don't tell them stop drinking milk or don't, don't drink any, have any butter, but you have to use that in moderation. Don't drink a lot of those things. Um, again, they're looking at the type of stone the patient's developing, what kind of help guide us, what kind of changes should you make in your diet. Um, don't get caught up in looking at every one of these slides and saying, oh, you know, how am I going to remember what to eat when or what kind of meds are used. Most stones are this, calcium oxalate. We tell most people to avoid these things. If a stone has a uric acid component to it or um, has urate, in the stone and the uric acid level is high for the patient, then we tell them not to eat those purines. The patient with gout has a high uric acid level and we tell them not to eat these foods with high purine sources. So try to make it as simple as possible. A lot of these slides kind of talk about that um, in, in a little more detail. Two things that you need to remember about gout or kidney stones, there's two different medications or not two things, two meds um, that we can tell the patient to take. One is for long-term to prevent kidney stones and gout. One medication is for right now, when you're having that gout attack, you have pain in your foot or your toe, or you're having that acute kidney stone pain, colchizine is a medication that we can use. And basically it's, it's an anti-inflammatory. Allopurinol is a med that's listed here on this side. The other name for it is Xylopurin. This is a medication that has helped to prevent the formation of uric acid. So write on your notes, allopurinol is a chronic medication. The patient takes it every day and it prevents uric acid from building up. So if you have kidney stones because your uric acid level is high, the doctor will put you on allopurinol. When you have the stone or you have the gout attack, colchizine, like C-O-L-C-H, I, C I M E is a medication we're going to give you right now to help get rid of that pain that you have. And it's a it's a med that you take two pills right now, and an hour you take another one, and then tomorrow you can take two more. It, it's like works quickly. Allopurinol is long term. So a couple things to remember here from these slides. Use allopurinol for your gout patient, and that's a chronic medication to prevent uric acid from building up. Colchicine is a med that we use right now. You still keep taking the allopurinol, but you take the colchicine for that gout attack that you have. And the only reason we talk about gout now is many times the patient that has gout is very, very likely to also have kidney stones right along with it. Maybe not at the same time, but high risk to have those stones. So again, look through these slides. I'm not gonna go over every single one. Most stones are calcium oxalate, so we tell the patient not to eat these things. Most stone, and uh, second category is urate stones because they're high uric acid. And then we tell them to limit their purines in their diet. So a lot of dietary management goes into the person with gout and the person with kidney stones in order to try to prevent the stones from happening. Once the stones happen, we know what renal colic pain looks like. We know how we're treating it. We're giving them fluids, we're training their urine, 
for treating your pain. We might be doing shock therapy in order to break up the stones. We may be doing some kind of surgical treatment or, or procedure in order to go in and remove those stones. And again, that's kind of in a nutshell what kidney stones are. We could study every single one of these slides, but you're not going to be the one going in and doing the surgical procedure. You're going to be taking care of the patient afterwards and doing education on things that you should try to avoid in your diet or things that you should do. Stay hydrated, keep drinking fluids, keep walking around to try to pass that stone, um, monitor your blood, your urine for blood, any of those things that you know is going to be education for the patient. So again, this is just talking about, can we go in and put a nephrostomy tube in? Sure. If there's a blockage from a stone and your kidney is not draining, a nephrostomy would be a tube that would be put in directly into your, um, into your kidney to drain your urine. And that would be surgically be done if we then have a large enough stone that's blocking the kidney from draining. That's all that this slide is saying. We talked about what urolithiasis is. It's the presence of stones in the urinary tract. The majority of stones are calcium phosphate or calcium oxalate. So now, uh, and again, other substances like uric acid can cause stones. Don't get caught up in all the different types of stones. We're not studying that here. What we're trying to recognize is there's three or four different categories. And what are some of the things that we tell the patient in their diet not to have? And look, a diet high in calcium is not to believe to be the cause, even though it says calcium oxalate. Don't always think, okay, avoid everything that has calcium in it. That's not always true. So again, if you read through these slides, most clients can expel stones without invasive procedures. Again, we already talked about that at the beginning. Here's some things that cause our increased risk for developing a kidney stone, urine sitting and not being voided out. Um, urinary retention, patient not getting up and moving around and being immobilized creates risk. Patient being dehydrated creates risk, particularly for the older adult patient. So here's your purines. These are the foods that you're going to tell the patient to avoid if they have a high uric acid level and their stone is a urate stone. And somewhere in your story, it'll tell you the patient's uric acid level is eight. That's too high. You want it below six. So then we tell them avoid the food. So your education would be to avoid the foods, the following types of foods. And here they are. Anchovies, brains, gravies, liver, sardines, red wine. It's not listed here, but it's on there. Foods that are moderately high. There's so many here. We're never going to remember all of them. But what you're looking for are those high purine foods because the patient has developed a stone because the uric acid level is high. I hope that's making sense. So here, here are some of our labs that we might do. What do you think we're going to see in our urinalysis for the patient that has a kidney stone? Well, it's going to be positive for blood, positive for white blood cells because they probably have a urine infection that goes right along with it, positive for bacteria. <clears throat> and now we might have some labs that we stick the patient, get blood from them, and the uric acid level is going to be high. And their calcium level might be too high. Not always, but we're looking at the picture of what we think is probably happening with this patient. Many times their urine sample is really cloudy, it's murky, it's not nice and yellow and clear. There's a stone that's blocking it, and so they it's created a urine infection, and that urine looks yucky, and it is. It's got bacteria in it, it's got blood in it, it's got white blood cells in it. Because the stone is there, and the urine itself is not clear and being and flowed through the ureter and through the bladder the right way. So here's our care. Increase your fluid intake to three or four liters, whatever it is, um, or greater by mouth or IV if the patient can't drink that much. Strain the urine. Give them pain medication. Remember, we want the pH of the urine to go back to normal between four to eight, somewhere around six. Here's our medications that we would be giving this patient. Uh, opioids for pain. Okay, if it's a uric acid stone, the doctor may start them on allopurinol. Remember, you've got to re recognize allopurinol is a chronic medication. It's for prevention. It's not for treatment. It's just for prevention. And then maintain fluid intake and hydration. So if the patient has um, a calcium oxalate stone, here's a whole listing here of foods that are high in oxalate. And again, you're not going to be able to remember every single one, but you'll start seeing them come up in questions. You may have already seen it. 
on some of those local things that are that you need to know on other things. Yeah, I think it's just it's hard to work with the education for your research. Your first expected problems, and that's what we're going to do. Things you know that we're going to have on all of you. We might be working some things through. Why am I meaning to suggest the showing of the problem? Why do you think it's going to be suggested to this? Are you going to be doing your research and the matter? You're going to see the issues there, right? Like, we are going to see them. Am I going to be a grouper? Probably not going to be a grouper because it's their opinion. And you might as well roll up. So you're going to attack hard on it. The treatment, the breed, the diet, the increase of the process of the name. And the name is not going to be an adequate exercise to this concern or this term. It's also a lot of time to be changing the name of that. Everything you brought up from the system, you're going to have a significant problem very quickly. So you said, there's something that can help that question, or maybe you really can help that advance through. And they may have hematuria, which a lot of times they do. Here are some of our tests that we're going to be doing for that patient. We're going to be getting an x ray of a KUB, kidneys, ureter, and bladder. We might be doing an ultrasound if we can't see it on the x ray. We might be doing an IV pilogram if we need to inject dye and find that stone. We may send the patient for you know, a CAT scan if we can't find it in other ways. We may do a blood sample of a uric acid level just to see if that's high for the patient. So there's lots of different tests that we can do. We're certainly going to start right from the beginning, getting a urine analysis. It's a pretty simple thing that we can do right as soon as the patient comes to us for pain. Okay, so pain-centered care. If it's greater than three or a significant pain, and again, don't look at this number and say, I'm only going to give morphine if the patient says their pain is greater than three. This is just kind of a general idea. Again, it's patient by patient basis. It's doctor ordered basis. So you have to make sure that you have opioids that are even ordered for the patient. Um, if the pain is significant and high number on a scale of one to 10, they're gonna give more pain. If the pain is you know one or two or three and it's manageable, we might give NSAIDs. There's an NSAID called Tordol. The name for Tordol is called Ketolorac. Basically, what is Tordol? It's IV motion. If you've ever had pain and some of you guys might have received Tordol, it's a pain med that works quickly. It's given IV. It's basically Motrin, but it's in an IV form. So you can't push Tordol, but you might be able to say, uh, anticipate the RN administering IV Ketolorac for minor pain. If the pain is significant and severe, we're going to give IV opioids for this patient. There's another pain um, medication down here called oxybutyn. That is for bladder spasms. So when the patient has kidney stones or has a UTI or cystitis, lots of times they'll get spasms and they have pain when they try to pee. Oxybutyn helps with that. And then of course, we're going to give them antibiotics um, because they are likely to develop a UTI if they don't already have the UTI going on because of the stone to begin with. So the antibiotics, it's kind of a combination. Opioids for pain, oxybutyn might be used for splatter spasm, antibiotics because they have a UTI, drink plenty of fluids, help the stone pass. If your pain starts to subside and it's not that bad, we might give you a ketolorac or, or Motrin, some kind of NSAID for this, for this pain that's now manageable for you. We might do some kind of surgical procedure, and we've already talked about some of them. This is your patient that has gout. Gout is a type of arthritis. The reason why people get gout is because the uric acid level in the body has elevated. The most common place that people will have symptoms from gout, I don't know why this is, but crystals form from the uric acid being high. And the most common place they have pain is in their toe, their great toe, their big toe. They, people can still have gout pain in their ankles and in their knees, but many times when you take care of a gout patient, one of the first places they start having pain, and this is severe pain, it's not like, oh, my toe hurts a little bit, it's my toe hurts, I can hardly walk, is because these uric acid, acid being high form crystals, and these crystals deposit themselves in this location in the body. I don't even know why that happens. But so here's the patient with gout. The only reason I have gout on this slide is gout and kidney stones. I keep saying that lots of times go together. The patient that has a risk for kidney stone also has a risk for gout. So uric acid level is high. It's above six. The patient has crystals that form, and those crystals deposit themselves 
between the toe or ankle or knee, usually lower extremity of this patient of gout. And all of a sudden that baby toe is enlarged, it's swollen, it's red, it's painful. Painful enough that if you see a question about gout, they don't even want you to put a sheet or anything over top of their foot. They want that foot exposed. That's how much pain it is that even some, a sheet or something laying on it creates severe pain. How do we prevent gout? Allopurinol, that's the med you could take every day to prevent uric acid from building up. Fluids. Gout is another thing that when people have a lot of purines in their diet, they get gout attacks. So go back to what we know about what has high purines gravies, mussels, sardines, red wine, everything that we knew was high in purines, same exact stuff for the person who has gout. We're going to tell them to avoid those things in their diet. Keep drinking. When they get dehydrated, bang, increased risk factor for gout attack to happen. Increased risk for kidney stones. So tell them to drink fluids, especially in the summer when you're more likely to get dehydrated. So here's your gout patient. Many times it's genetic. There sometimes is a genetic link. Factors that increase the, the chance or the likelihood of developing gout. And remember, gout is a type of arthritis. It's because uric acid level has built up in the body. So it's different than osteoarthritis, where we get arthritis in our joints because we use it too much. Gout is because uric acid level has built up. And sometimes we don't even know the cause for why sometimes people get gout, but it's sometimes called gouty arthritis. What happens? Uric acid crystals form, pain, Classic sign and symptom, I learned this in nursing school, everybody learns this in nursing school, extreme pain in the big toe. It's crazy, but again, even a sheet touching your toe, they don't want a fan, don't pick a fan if that's one of your options. Even the air from the fan hurts, hurts the toe. Cold wind makes your toe hurt worse. I mean, it's severe, severe pain. What are you gonna give a patient that has a gout attack? Colchicine. That means that med is really strong anti-inflammatory, helps get rid of the uric acid crystals and tell the patient, drink a lot of extra fluid today to help that gout attack go away. And here it is, stopping the attack. Take NSAIDs, rest your foot, drink fluid. Here's your med, Coltivine, that you're gonna tell the patient to take right now for that acute attack. It decreases the inflammatory response and helps that pain from the gout attack get better. So here's your anti-gout drugs. They again work hand in hand trying to prevent kidney stones. Colchizine is an acute medication. Allopurinol is maintenance medication. And again, this is just talking about how we use these different things. And then of course we tell them, manage your diet so you don't have this gout attack again. If you, uh, shellfish is a big trigger for purines. And so that means shrimp, um, lobster, crabs, uh, beer, so crabs and beer could be a bad trigger for this patient um, if they have a likelihood of developing gout. Uric acid levels, we'd like them to be below six. There's our risk factor for developing gout, kind of similar to our risk factors for the patient that can get the kidney stones. This is what purines are, and, we, and if we, they build up in our system, they um, form into uric acid, and these uric acid level creates crystals, and this was just explaining how this happens. Here's our normal urine, uric acid levels. And this is blood that we're drawing. It has nothing to do with urine. It's not a urine sample, it's a blood sample. Normal uric acid levels are two to six for a female, three to seven for a male. Hard numbers to remember. So we always, I always like to remember that I want the uric acid level to be below six. That's the highest number for the female and certainly somewhere around the middle to high for the male. And we tell people that, okay, you have a gout attack, First thing they're gonna check is the uric acid level. We're gonna stick the patient, get a blood sample. Uric acid level is nine. What do we know? Well, what have you been eating in your diet? Have you been drinking enough fluids? Well, we need to give you some more water today. We need to give you some IV fluids to try to flush out that uric acid out of your system. Your kidneys, for whatever reason, aren't getting rid of enough uric acid level. Tell me what you had to eat in the last couple of days. That's that's gout management. Have you been taking your allopurinol? People say, oh, well, I haven't had a gout attack. I stopped taking it. Well, it's maintenance therapy to prevent the uric acid level from building back up in the system. So here's some high purine foods. Again, remember this is your patient that has a kidney stone too. And the kidney stone is urate, U-R-A-T-E. That's the type of stone that develops with high uric acid. So here's high purine foods, things that you would tell them to avoid. 
And even though you're saying, oh my gosh, I thought spinach, cauliflower, asparagus were good for you. Not good for these patients. See, lots of seafood, not good for these patients. Organ meats, beef, beer, liquor, wine. You know, so again, there's a patient having crabs and beer, not good for the gout patient. It's gonna create an attack probably less than 24 hours later because it doesn't take long after they eat these things if they're high risk for that gout arthritis to develop. So this is a good slide for us to remember. If the patient needs to be on a low purine diet, these are the things that they're gonna avoid. They don't want to eat these things because it's gonna create that trigger for that gout to happen. Here's our risk factors for somebody with gout. Same risk factors almost for the patient with the kidney stones. Male, middle age, drink alcohol, loves that high purine diet, sits around a lot, is not very active, doesn't exercise, so they can get a whole lot of activity to try to keep things flowing through their system, and they're overweight. Now, if you answer most of these questions, you're prone to a gout. There's some things to avoid listed in this left column. I would study through them and this could be your NCLEX question about the patient with gout, things that they should avoid. Drinks that contain sugar, soda, juices that contain sugar, sugar. Limit these things. You can eat some of them, but I would limit them. And then these are the things that you can eat. And notice how dairy is on this. So it's like a whole different thing. We don't always tell them don't have dairy. These people with a high uric acid level need to avoid the purine foods that are listed here on the left side. Okay. And this is just another way of listing. Um, these are all things that they should avoid. This slide here, everything they should avoid. All uh, the seafoods, different types of meats that are listed here, asparagus, spinach, even though we think, oh, that stuff should be good for you, not good for these patients because it creates uric acid level buildup in their system. Okay, let's answer a couple questions. A nurse is caring for a client who has a left renal calculi and has an indwelling catheter. So they got a catheter in. That's our story that the catheter is draining. Which of the following findings is the priority for the nurse to report? So they have a left kidney stone. Everybody needs an answer in the chat. Left kidney stone. They have a catheter in. What are we going to report? Flank pain that radiates to the lower abdomen. Client report of nausea. Absent urine output for one hour, white blood cell count of 15,000. So how, how do you know? Everybody want to, if you're looking at this, don't go for the pain every time. What do we expect this patient to have if they have a left kidney stone? We expect them to have pain. That's a given. It doesn't mean that we didn't do anything about it. It's just that's an expected finding for this patient. Do we expect them to have nausea? Yes, we do. That's one of the signs and symptoms of the left kidney stone. Do we expect them to not have urine output for one hour? No, that's our biggest problem because look, in the story, they have a catheter. Shouldn't that catheter be draining? If somebody has a catheter, it continually drains at least a little bit. For the last hour, it has not drained at all. What do we think has happened? That stone has completely blocked the urethra. And even though the catheter is in, there's nothing coming through. And that's a medical emergency, that's an issue. White blood cell count of 15,000. And you're saying, well, wait, that's too high. Well, it normally is high because they have a left kidney stone. We expect it to be high because we probably have a urinary tract infection with it. So our answer should have been C. These other things are things that we would expect to see. And that's not the priority. If we call somebody that has a left kidney stone, we call the doctor and say they have pain, the doctor's gonna say, okay, give them the pain medication. We expect that to happen. If you say the patient has nausea, well, we expect that to happen. What we don't expect and what our priority is is that they don't have urine for an hour and that's what we got to report to the doctor. Okay, a nurse is reinforcing teaching with a client who is scheduled for extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy. And it doesn't even matter really what that is. Um, we're not doing it, so we don't have to know everything about it. But what we do recognize is lithotripsy. So that's going in with shock waves and breaking up the stone. Which of the following statements by the client indicates understanding of the treatment? I will be fully awake during the procedure. What did we say? That if you stayed in a little bit, that they're not completely awake, but they're not completely under general anesthesia either. Lithotripsy will reduce my chances of having stones in the future. Us doing shockwave therapy, is that going to prevent them from developing stones later? No. What's going to prevent it is their diet management and staying high hydrated and things that we know that they can do. I will report any bruising that occurs to my doctor. 
What do we say is expected after they have shock therapy? We expect some bruising to happen. We expect a little bit of urine blood to be in your urine. We said that's expected. We, we know that that's probably going to happen. We tell the patient, you might have some bruising on your side here. That's okay. 